Stir up your power, O Lord, and with great might come among us. And because we are sorely hindered by our sins, let your bountiful grace and mercy speedily help and deliver us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. I don't know about you, but I put all my decorations out early this year. I have decked the halls with bow and greenery, sent my Christmas cards, and baked up a storm. As I spoke with the friends, I noticed that many of them were doing the same thing. In a year of so much sadness, loss, and pain, we all seem ready for some good news, something to celebrate, like the arrival of hope and love incarnate, an event that unites people in love. When the leaves have fallen from the trees and the branches are bare in the darkest and shortest days of the year, we put greenery and lights outside and inside our homes. For many, this is the time of year to draw close to family and friends, to share a meal, to laugh, and be with those we love. I think I'm leaning into hope this year, hope for things to change, hope for the future, hope for the coming of Christ into our hearts and homes once again. But I must stop first and acknowledge that this has been a particularly hard year. There are many things to grieve in 2020. Where do you start? Perhaps you have lost work or income and fear your financial future. Perhaps you have had health issues and have lost some of your independence and are sick and tired of being isolated at home. Perhaps you grieve for everything that you've missed this year, that trip or family reunion, that wedding, birthday, or graduation celebration. Perhaps this year has been hard on your spirit and you are experiencing depression and anxiety like never before. Perhaps you long to be together for worship, but can't because it's not safe yet. Perhaps you feel that 2020 has been a year that started in Lent and just stayed in Lent without the proper joyous celebration of Easter. And perhaps you never imagined how much you would long to sit in your church pew, to hear the prelude, to laugh with your friends, to pass the peace, and to sing. Maybe for you the holidays are particularly painful because you're grieving the loss of a loved one, someone you love and miss but no longer see. It is painful to even attempt to celebrate without them. You miss their smile, their laugh, their touch. You miss their wit, their stubbornness, their humor. You miss who you were when you were with them and how they made you feel. For many of us, the garment of ashes is the ever-present reality that life as we know it has changed forever. The loss is so heavy that we literally wear it on our bodies like a garment. So how do we get through these hard days when the dark night is longer than the daytime? It comforts me somehow to know that our God sees me in my grief that God sees me in my despair and loves me right where I am. It comforts me to know that God loves me in the darkest of days. God loves me and is with me in the sleepless nights and in the anxious moments. God even loves me enough to send a prophet, a disciple, and his beloved son Jesus to remind me that God loves me and God loves you. And God loves each of us enough to give us words of encouragement in Holy Scripture. Scripture that reminds us of these truths. 
God loves us. God is with us. And God will help restore us once again. In Isaiah, the Psalm, and Thessalonians, in each lesson, the writer is speaking to people who are suffering and losing hope. In each lesson, the writer knows that the people are hurting and reminds them of the truth of God. In Isaiah, the prophet declares that God will provide for those who mourn in Zion to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. The prophet Isaiah speaks messages of hope to the people of God because God promises to be in everlasting covenant with them. The city where hopelessness had taken root will with God's spirit and God's blessing sprout righteousness and praise and hope because a new future is possible. Our psalmist declares, when the Lord restored our lives in Zion, then we were like those who dream. Then were our mouths filled with laughter and our tongues with shouts of joy. That Lord restored the people like the watercourses of the Negev. Those who sowed with tears will reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping and carrying the seed will come again shouldering the sheaves. The exile has ended. In one commentary, it said, The joy and laughter that followed their return home from Babylon was now in the past. The community is left hoping that once again the Lord will do a great thing for us. The psalmist compares God's work of restoration to a dry wadi in the Negev, where for months on end the wadi remained a wasteland where survival of any living thing remains in doubt. But in a moment, as the sky opens up and the torrents of rain begin, the wadi turns from a life-depriving sight to a life-sustaining source. That is what restoration looks like. That is what the community longs for, to know the great works of God and to relish in the full life-giving power that will come with its restoration. In today's epistle, Paul is deeply concerned about the Thessalonians because they too have undergone suffering and persecution and the entire congregation has lost hope. That is when Paul tells them to rejoice always, to pray without ceasing, and to give thanks in all circumstances. Not because life is easy or life is good, but because God is good. Paul does not tell the people to try harder. No, Paul instead tells the people to find encouragement in the knowledge that God will remain faithful. And that is good news. Holy Scripture reminds us that suffering is not new. And I know that past suffering does not ease our pain. But God promises to be with us through the suffering. And God promises to be with us in the midst of the dark night of the soul. And God promises that this too shall pass. Weeping may last for the night, but there is a song of joy in the morning. This does not mean it isn't going to be hard today. This does not mean that our grief will magically go away. No, but it does mean that there is hope. Hope for healing. Hope for laughter. Hope for me and hope for you. It means there is hope for restoration, not to the way things once were, but hope for for a new life to come. Holy Scripture reminds us that God has restored the people from great loss before, and God will restore us once again. It's as if God is reaching from the pages of the Bible to say, I see you. I hear you. I feel your pain. And I promise this is not the final answer. The good news is that God is good and his mercy is everlasting and his faithfulness endures from age to age. The good news is that God will wipe away every tear and walk with you in the midst of your pain. The 
good news is that God will never abandon or forsake you, and God will be with you as you rebuild, not to restore our lives to their former glory, but to restore and rebuild and help us return to new life. One breath, one step, one day at a time. And God promises to bind up the brokenhearted and to help restore the lives in the people in the midst of the darkness, drought, and pain. God is faithful. God is with us every step of the way. God will never abandon us. And God is restoring and helping to heal us. Our awesome God has restored his people before and our awesome God will restore us once again. Amen. Rejoice in the Lord always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise the words of the prophets, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. And may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.